Okay, hello everyone. Today we're going to be speaking about screen-free parenting. With us today we have PhD Megan Owens, um, a psychologist who works as a psychology professor. Um, she's also a stay-at-home mom um, to two children, five-year-old and a two-year-old. Um, and the interesting part about it is that her children have never really watched uh, television or screens. I mean, they see them on occasion when they go out somewhere, but it's not something that she has in her home. And so today she's going to be sharing with us um, how, uh, why she has kept her children screen-free and the importance of protecting our children from screens. So I'm really excited about this chat today because this is a dear subject to me. Um, so hello, Megan. How are you? Hi, Jamie. Thank you for having me. Good to have you. Thank you so much for chatting with me today. Um, so let's start off with uh, you telling us a little bit about yourself and how you came to be a screen-free parent. Okay, great. It's funny to be sort of defined as a screen-free parent because before the website, it was something that we just didn't do. So you didn't really, we didn't really think about it. But now we're sort of with our with our blog that we run, defining ourselves by something we don't do. Um, yes. I, I'm a psychologist, and so we started out when my daughter was born, she's my oldest, um, just sort of following the recommendations, you know, I knew the research behind the American Academy of Pediatrics recommendations to keep your kids screen free until two, so we followed that, and then when she turned two, we kind of looked around at some of the problems that other kids were having, and the problems that she wasn't having, and how well she was doing, and it really seemed like you know, well, what's so different for today from yesterday? You know, why don't we keep this going? She seems to be doing so well. Um, you know, she's so interested in books. She loves to be outside. And we didn't really want to introduce something at that point that was going to um, maybe threaten that. Yes. Um, and then we knew that I was pregnant with my son, and it was made sense because we knew we wanted him to be screen-free at least for the first two years. So it made sense to keep her screen-free yes. longer. Um, and it's just... Once you live without it, you really don't need it. They, no, don't, they don't need it. Um, no. They're really, really happy without it. So it, yes. it works out well for us. That is, that is so amazing because now, now in, in the times that we are, more than ever before in history, um, children are watching so much television and they're being exposed to so much screen time. I think the average now is like six hours of screen yes. time per child. In America, at least I'm talking about and right. and I really do think that children are being inundated with uh, adult imagery. Even I see it yeah. in my kids. Um, there was a point where my kids were watching like an hour of screen a day, and I saw it in their play. It would play out. It would come out in their play, and I would hear the adult uh, imagery in their play, right. or 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 whatever was being uh, seen in the cartoons. Like I was, I would hear my. Um, little ones say, let's go find the elements, magic, and all this stuff. And I'm like, where are they <laughs> getting this from? And they would, and they would also uh, be mean towards each other in, in, in a way that, that was never really taught at home. And so that really got me thinking. Um, it was almost like they were uh, acting out what they were seeing in order to process it. I didn't know right. if they really understood it, and and a lot of it was that they were watching a lot of even the cartoons you see a lot of sar like sarcastic and cynical and just plain mean talk in these cartoons. I couldn't believe it when I actually sat down and watched some of it with them. Um, right. And so this got me thinking about um, what is this doing to my my children's mind? Um, are they really being themselves? They they're just putting a mask and and just playing out what they're seeing. Um, and then I, I got into like the nature shows. That's like like the next process. So I got out the cartoons, got started doing the nature shows, and then I, I started realizing that these nature shows shows are like are like nature on steroids. It's like you, 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 the <laughs> focusing in on the animals with intense sound and like fast changing images. It's right. intense. It's like super heightened, um, and it really is overstimulating. I think, and and, and so yeah. like I, I would I would observe them and. And I think it really does stimulate the children, overstimulate them. So, like, when, when they would go out in nature, they would be bored or they wouldn't even notice, like, a simple thing, like a gnat walking by or something. That would not right. captivate them anymore. Um, right. So this really started um, getting me to do more research, and, and I came upon your website. So I'm really glad I found okay. it. So, Megan, can you tell us? I mean, I, I said a little bit. I said two points here. Um, could you tell us a little bit about the research, what it says about screens and, and the effects it has on children? Yes, and it's so mentioned that, funny that you mentioned the sibling relationship, because while that wasn't one of the reasons I started out screen-free with my daughter, of course, she was the only child at the time, but now that I have two, they're 
the best of friends. Wow. And so limiting screens to me is really important to that because any little, you know, um, any movie that I can recall from childhood, a Disney movie or a TV show, the siblings are always, the relationship is always yes. displayed in, in a negative way. I see and that. Her, when she had a baby brother, it didn't occur to her that this would be a negative relationship in part because she had never been exposed to that, you know? And so there's, that's not one of the research reasons to keep them screen free. But when we think about the content and the values that we're trying to instill, a lot of times they're not the same. Um, and yet as parents, we're not as flashy and as interesting as a screen. And so how can we compete with something oh, yes. with cute characters that are acting in a way that are really appealing to them? Um, but I like to sort of talk about the research in five general areas, the five sort of risks for ch young children watching too much screens. Okay, we're back. We lost connection here. Um, we are going through a snowstorm, so hopefully we will be able <laughs> to not have any more technical difficulties here. So, Megan, we were talking about um, you telling us a little bit about the research, what the research says about screens and the effects it has on children. Can we continue with that? Yeah, yeah. So I was saying there's generally five research areas that I think are good motivators to keep children's screen time really limited. Or if you're like me, even just go ahead and go screen free. I think it's easier to be screen free than it is to try to limit them. But oh, yes, um, definitely. Yeah, it's easier <laughs> on kids. I mean, the screens are not designed to be used for 30 minutes at a time. And so, of course, it's hard for kids to turn them off. But one is what you were talking about with the how rapidly the screen shifts, even in a nature show. Um, and so they talk about that as an overstimulation hypothesis that the rapid image change that are part of children's programming preconditions their mind to expect rapid change and the natural environment is not like that. And so then when they go outside in nature and it's not as exciting and it's not as rapidly changing, it's much more slower paced, they have attentional problems. Um, and so there's a long, longitudinal study that shows for each hour of screen time prior to age three, the children were 10% more likely to have attentional and behavior problems at age seven, so once they were in school. Um, and the, the theory behind that is that, that the children's programming is just shifting so rapidly. Yes. So, so attention problems is one reason to keep uh, screens away from young children. Another one is language. So particularly for the under two, under three set, a lot of parents will turn to screens um, using baby Einstein videos or something like that to teach mm -hmm. their children language. Um, and what the research continually shows about that is that those videos do not work at all. Um, they have been sued because they do not work. They have, uh, you know, one company went out of business. Baby Einstein is owned by Disney, so they're not going to go out of business. <laughs> but they did settle a lawsuit um, because researchers have really looked at every way they can trying to show the babies those videos multiple times, and the babies don't know the words any better than chance, yes. even when they watch the video 20 sometimes. Um, and then other research showed, showed that for each hour that children under two watch, watch, they had six to eight fewer words. So at a time when children are trying to add, they learn best from interacting with a person yes, back and forth, not from the screen. Um, so language is the second reason. The third reason is sleep. Uh, the research on sleep and screens is really good. Um, hours of screen time is associated with both a later bedtime, more interruptions throughout the night, and the, less sleep overall so total number of hours yes. overall um and we all want our kids to sleep of course as yeah. much as possible they need it <laughs> yeah. we need it yeah so. <laughs> anything that's gonna interrupt sleep to me is out that's like the you know the thing goes on right um and then the fourth uh, fourth reason is the research connecting screen time with obesity which can take a number of different pathways you know certainly when kids are watching screens they're not up and active. Oh, yes, if, yes. if the screens are not there, kids are running around, right? But if the screen is there, they're sedentary. And then a lot of the products that are advertised via screens are not the most nutritious foods. Um, or if they're cross-marketed, you know, SpongeBob is usually not on an orange, but he is on a box of Lucky Charms or something like that. And so that cross-marketing gets to children when they go into the store. Um, so that can have a relationship with obesity as well. Um, and then the, the fifth reason is what we talked about a little bit with in terms of you seeing the, the children, their sibling relationship not being great. And that's the, the relationship in between screens and aggression. And that is also a really well-documented link um, that when children watch 
TV shows that have any kind of aggression, and aggression can mean physical aggression, like hitting, yes. but it can also just mean Verbal. you know social exclusion or unkind words or those sorts of things that the children who watch those programs are more likely to exhibit that, of course. It's social learning. That's how kids yes. learn. Um, and the research on that is really interesting because a lot of children's programs use um, a sort of method where they will show some unkind behavior, um, and then there will be a lesson, and they'll try to show that it wasn't nice to not share or it wasn't nice to exclude somebody. But when kids watch that, they call that, uh, researchers call that aggressive pro-social media. When kids watch aggressive pro-social media, they don't walk away with the lesson that adults do. They walk away more likely to yes. being aggressive. So there was an episode they did a uh, study with Clifford the Big Red Dog where they were excluding and being nasty to a three-legged dog. Yes. They thought they could get sick from him, yada, yada, yada. But at the end, the message was about inclusion and, and helping people with disabilities and everything. Well, when they tested the kids after the, watching this 10-minute segment, the children were more likely to have the beliefs, you know, that they shouldn't be friends with somebody with a disability, that they should exclude them, than they were pre-episodes. Wow. So young children, those that study was done on four-year-olds. So young children just aren't good at connecting that whole narrative that we can yes. as adults. All they see is the conflict. Yes, I definitely agree with you. I think that the perception of the world is distorted. It's almost like they got this like grown up view instead of their own view. Their, their, that innocence that you see in children is eliminated. And that's what I started seeing in my children. That is the exact reason why I stopped having them watch cartoons. And then I moved on to the nature shows and I explained to you what happened with that. But it's a process, you know. And, and I, I definitely do believe everything that you said about the research, I, I definitely have seen that in my own kids, um, it definitely, I've seen, it affects their creativity, their attention yeah. span, um, their ability to focus, like, on one task. Um, right. So, now that we know what, what screens are doing to our children, um, can you share with us, uh, how do you keep your children busy and entertained when doing housework, when doing focused work? Because that is something that parents do. What they do is they use television as a nanny, as a, a someone to watch their kids, because kids tend to stay so still when right. they're in front of that screen. So can you share with us some things that you do with your kids to uh, keep them entertained? Absolutely. You know, um, on the one hand, when people ask that question, I, um, I, I mean, I do have some tips and tricks that I'll share, but on the one hand, I, I say, well, they play. Yes. Because they've never, <laughs> they've never they had do. screens. And so what happens is, you know, probably when we were kids or the generation after us, in the 70s and the 80s, the average age of introduction to television was four years old. But now the average age of introduction to regular television use is four months old. Wow. So the, the, before they even have the capacity to learn how to entertain themselves and play independently and, and all of that, they're getting a screen in front of them. So That's what's hard. really happening in, in that case is that the parent is kind of hijacking the child's ability. They need to struggle a little bit with some boredom and, and some uncertainty. Yes, and then they will develop a routine of how they play by themselves. Certainly that's a little bit easier as children are able to safely entertain themselves, you know, over the age of two or so. Um, but I do keep in the areas that are sort of high, mom needs to do something independent and kids may be likely to need something. I think it just takes a little bit of planning in advance. So in my kitchen, I have a special cabinet that has sensory bins and things that they can only do yes. when I'm cooking dinner or something. So this is special. So now they're like, Oh my gosh, yeah, you something that's new. great. I'm going to go play in the rice bin because I know that's I can great. play in that. I have the same thing in my bathroom, a cabinet that, you know, especially the baby. He, well, he's not a baby, but he's my baby. He's two. <laughs> he, if he wakes up early and I'm still getting ready for the day, he can come in and he knows he gets to play in that special bathroom cabinet that has that's interesting great. things for him, flashlights, whatever. Uh, and so he, but while they have these interesting toys that I set aside, they're still directing their own playing okay. attention. They're deciding from that what to play with. Um, and they're listening to me. You know, I might be talking while I'm cooking or whatever or, or talking about what they're doing. And so they're having that social interaction. Yes, uh, yes. So they're, they're developing abilities. You know, they're developing their creativity. They're developing their problem solving. They're developing their play and their attention spans as opposed to putting something in front of them. That's really easy as the adult, but you're not letting them develop anything. Yes during that time frame then. I, I definitely agree with you, with, with especially with the sensory bins. Children love sensory bins. 
Um, I I always recommend open-ended toys, toys that children can use their imaginations with, that they can create with, instead of toys that that have a bunch of lights and a bunch of sounds. That's really overstimulating. I I always just uh, buy, like, natural toys, like nature blocks or animals. Those are open-ended, like... Like you said, a sensory bins. Play-Doh is always great as well. Yeah. Um, having like a little Play-Doh bin with everything in there, like the, the the molds and the rollers and everything, and then just bringing it out whenever you want to have that focus time, whenever someone's cooking. But they right. do, like you said, entertain themselves. It's amazing. When I took the cartoons away from my children as an experiment, um, they at first really were very upset and um, they wanted yeah. the cartoons. And then after a while, they just immersed in play and, and it was like amazing to watch them how my sofa became like a, a boat and they were going somewhere I don't even know where they would play under the table and that would be like a castle and it was just incredible and I think that's what children really need to do to play and and use their imagination and that's how they develop and unfold um, and, and I think, some of it some of it is like our trust as adults that we don't have to entertain them all the time we don't have to provide something for them all the time, if we just sit back and wait, give them a little bit of a minute, you know, to struggle and to figure out what it is they're going to do, and then let them go. If you trust or respect their process, my, my kids now they're like they're two and five, and they will play for hours. I mean, uh, running back it's and amazing. forth, yes. rooms, rooms, slamming the doors, them. monster, this and that. They and become closer. Stuff. Yes, I've seen yeah, that in my children. Yeah, super close. And instead of just sitting, staring at something where they have no interaction with each other. So yes, and and I really want also wanted to mention that I really love like the uh, the Waldorf toys, like the faceless dolls, because the faceless dolls don't have an expression. So the child is, it can be any expression. It can have any face they created. Yeah. And, and so like I like I was telling you before, I I visit Amish country. And for those yeah. of you who don't know, Amish country is a place where uh, this particular group of people, they do not have electricity running into their homes and they don't have, obviously don't have screens, don't have television. And so they have mm-hmm. very simple toys. They have faceless dolls and they start school at seven. And I really see a difference. Every time I go there every summer, I see a difference in these children. It's quite amazing. So um, I invite... I think, I think a difference in their culture and our culture and, and something that I, you know, I have a, a system that I designed, we call it the spoil system. This is the five activities that kids should be doing every day instead of screens or at least before they get to screens. And one of them is is work, is independent work. And that's something that the Amish culture is, yes. is a part of their lifestyle from day one. And so a lot of times my kids play, sometimes they're in sensory bins, but sometimes when I'm working in the kitchen, they're working with me. You know, they have both the two-year-old and the five-year-old have chores that they do on a daily basis and that they like to do. And, and that they feel a sense of accomplishment and pride from doing, um, which is really a different feeling yes. than, than I need to be entertained all the time and I'm going to sit here and something is going to dance and play in front of me when mom can't pay attention to me. Yes, they don't demand that, that constant attention. They, they, they can entertain themselves. And that's, that's, like you said, we don't really need to entertain children. We don't. They, they do it themselves. Yeah, <laughs> they have an imagination that is just beyond what I I, I can ever imagine. Um, so, yeah. so what about screens and parents? I mean, we we talk about managing our screens for children, and us parents more than ever before are using technology. We the smartphones more than ever before. If you go to the parks, you see moms on their phones on Facebook. If not, they're just taking pictures of their kids going on the slides. And it's like t- everything is a picture. Like if you got to take a picture of your meal, you got to take a picture of your child going on the slide. It's just they always see their parents on their screens. And we are showing them an example by, by, doing, by doing that. So can you tell us a little bit about how you manage your media in your home? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think we started the blog Screen Free Parenting about a year ago. And that's when I realized how hard It can be because the blog can be all consuming um, in terms of keeping up with with people and and connecting with people and helping people. Um, But so if I find it difficult to regulate my screen time, how, and I have, you know, a fully developed brain, I hope at this point. um, So how can we expect a four-year-old or a six-year-old or a 15-year-old to be able to regulate their own screen time? It's just, it's not built that way. It's not built to be put down. Um, so personally, for me, I have a smartphone and I have a, a child um, safety application on it so that I can't access anything on it except for calls and texts. 
Oh, wow. I don't Great want, idea. I don't want to do anything else on it. Great idea. It's there. You know, I'm tempted to do it, and I don't want that, temp- that temptation. You know, I just want to do it on my computer when I have the time to sit down and do yes. it. Yes. Um, because it really does. The phone becomes kind of that third person in oh, yes. between you and your child. Um and they don't know what you're doing. If, if you're answering a really important work email or, you know, you're doing something, ordering diapers on Amazon or something, they don't know that you're not just playing. You know, to them, you're going to do whatever they think kid is done on screens, which is a game or a TV show. And that is more important than them in that moment. Um, and so I always think about how I hope my kids will treat me when I'm a teenager, which is when they're a teenager, which probably is going to be that great. But you know, if, if I'm doing this now, then when they're a teenager, that's what they're going to be doing with me when they have the capability to do that. Because I'm setting the standard for what a relationship is. Um, so I don't use my phone when I'm with them. Like I said, there's nothing on it. It's just phone calls and texts. So there's really no reason to. Um, and I, I do my work when they're napping or when they're at, at preschool. I totally agree with you. I think parents really are sending their children a message when their children come up to them and they're on their phones or on on a screen and they're just ignoring the child. The child doesn't really understand what's going on. The, ch- right. the child is really just, they're receiving this message that what they have to say is not important. Right. That the screen, that, that, that thing in your hand, their phone, is really more important than them at that moment. And, and we don't want to send that message to our children. That's a really powerful message to send. So yeah. I, you know, even when I'm using my computer, um, if my child comes to talk to me, I, I make a point to look away from the computer, look directly to my child, even if it's to tell them I am working on something right now, give me 10 minutes. But I will look directly at them and tell them that because I, I don't want that to send that message that I'm ignoring them. It's just a really sad message to send to your children. And, and, and a lot of parents do it today. They're constantly on their phones. I forgot what the, I think the average now is like five hours of adults on their smartphones now and it really if if any of you out there want to know how long you're spending on your smartphones download an app i'll post a link on the description box and you will Mm -hmm. be surprised i personally don't have a smartphone i have an old flip phone i um (laughs) i really didn't like uh how i was becoming with my phone i personally do you know um did not like having the internet in my pocket at all times i realized that people really are using their minds less nowadays um, yeah. They have their smartphones. They're being really, they're depending too much on it, and their logic and memory is just less now. I mean, before people used to memorize phone numbers and roads and everything, back roads. Now everything is like people just completely are dependent on their smartphones, and I didn't want that. I'm like really, so I still have a landline. I have an old flip phone that I bring out only when I'm going out to like where I can't be reached or something like hiking or something mm-hmm. like that. Um, but. Um, yeah, that's that's it's it's a radical way of doing things, but you know you don't really have to get rid of your smartphone. You can do something like what Megan has done. You could also sure. um, turn off all the notifications on your phone, um, sure. so you're not constantly responding to these uh, sounds, um, notifications from like social media and everything, because it really is living a life distracted. Um, Isn't so- it interesting too how we have gotten you know mindfulness is becoming so interesting. More people are engaging in mindfulness practices and meditating and things like that and part of that is because people are not able to be mindful in their daily lives anymore because the phone is interrupting that you know we're most engaged and we're most we're happiest we rate our well-being as being the highest when we're present in the present moment whatever that is and the phone does the opposite of that the phone takes you to tomorrow and yesterday and to somebody else's moment and everything else so yes it's yeah, I don't I don't like having a smartphone. So <laughs> I find people missing like just little moments. Just I, I see people on downtimes, even waiting on, on a line. They're always on their phones. If they're waiting in a car somewhere, it's constant right. on their phones. And and I do really think that it really does affect the experience that people are having um, and the little things that they're missing that are right in front of them. And so I really do encourage all of you who are listening to take measures to to um, Either get a, a, what a flip phone like I have or maybe download an app like Megan has or turn off all the notifications on your phone and live more present because that's really important. I also have a drop-off zone in my house, which I um, I tell anyone who comes in to please drop off their phones there um, nice. because it really is distracting. Uh, before, we'd have family over and, and, and we'd be sitting at the dinner table and they would be on their phones, checking their phones. It's just it's, it's terrible. I, I really don't like the feeling of that. 
And yeah. so that's what I have a little, I have a video on the drop off zone that I created. I'll link it below in the description, but okay. Megan, it's been great talking to you. Can you give us any final words of advice? Let's say a parent says, I really want to do this. I, I maybe I have, you know, caused a lot of damage onto my kids by letting them watch so much television. What can I do? Is it too late? How can I start to, to get the ball rolling to, um, get on this path? It's not, it's not too late. You know, your child's brain is a continually developing thing. So I would encourage you, if just like J.D., if you saw something in your children that you don't like, that you think is attributed to the screens, to begin to cut them down. And I, I'll give you two really easy ways to do that. One is to replace the screen with something more interesting. So we have a couple of, of articles. For example, we moved, when we really got into this, moved our TV out of the living room and put instead a large uh, cabinet that is filled with board games and puzzles and things that the kids love. So, that, so it was like, they didn't care where the TV went because they were, I mean, they never watched it, but you know, they were, they had these things to play with. The same thing, you know, if you want to do no more TV in the morning or no more TV at dinner time, create a cabinet. And we have posts about those on the website too create a cabinet and they're not going to ask you about the screen when they now have this really interesting cabinet yes. with sensory bins and different things there. Um, and if you just want to cut back, there's four sort of key times that you can cut screens out that you'll kind of see the most bang for your buck. The first is in the morning um, because of the effects of screen time on attention. You don't want to start the day off with the screens. And so eliminate them from your morning routine if you have them there. The second is, uh, when you're eating. So as a family, make sure that as parents, you model putting the phones or whatever else where and there's no screens during dinner time, no television watching during dinner time. Uh, and, and having family meals together is like this huge research thing because it's associated with so many positive outcomes for children. Um, the third is you want to eliminate any screens from the bedroom. I think you know, yes. for everybody, but especially for your children, if you're going to allow them to have screens, they should never be allowed in the bedroom. You can't monitor them there. And they have a really negative impact on sleep. And then the fourth time you want to eliminate them is in the car um, because that's sort of a natural time for connection. You, neither you nor your child is doing anything other than driving the vehicle. And so you can talk during that time or they can look out the window and have an opportunity to be bored. So if you get rid of them during those four times, um, that'll send you off in a really good direction. And if you want to get rid of them altogether, just spend, you know, an evening or two creating something really interesting like a kitchen cabinet or or whatever for them that you can replace it and say, yeah, we're not going to do screens anymore. You know, mommy or daddy didn't like whatever was the consequence you saw on the child, but instead we've made this for you. And this is all the interesting things that you can do during this time now. Yes, um, definitely. The, the main thing is once you turn off that screen, once you turn off that television, kids will learn to occupy themselves and, and many creative ways. They will just start doing their own little uh, creative play and go into their own little worlds like my children have done. Yeah. Um, so, and, and a lot of people worry, am I sheltering my kids from, from the world out there? And, and I say to you, um, I think we need a little sheltering from screens. Um, <laughs> uh, we need a little sheltering from mass media, from TV, from yeah. our iPhones. They will have the rest of their lives to be on media. When I okay. see a two-year-old on an iPhone, and I see that quite often nowadays, it's mind-blowing because I, I think about this. That child will have the rest of their life to be on an iPhone. Why not? Why now? Right. The, you're only a child for, for a, a certain amount of time, very short period of time, and you're an adult your whole life. <laughs> so we cannot let media uh, be a babysitter because I think that nanny has a high price. We think it's free. We don't have to pay anyone. You know, they're there in front of the, the, the TV, but it's a high price in, in the long run. Right. Yeah. So Megan, it has been a pleasure talking with you. I really love your website. Can you tell us where viewers can go and visit and what are some things that you have there on your website? Sure. Um, so the website is www.screenfreeparenting.com. Um, and there's a Twitter account and a Pinterest account and a Facebook account associated. Facebook is probably the most active one. Um, on Facebook, there's both the Screen Free Parenting site where you can get articles and things like that. But there's also the Screen Free Parenting Community, which we started um, at the request of our readers. And so there's a lot of parents on there that are either screen free like we are, or are attempting to limit or are attempting to cut down. And you're able to post and get support from other oh, that's um, great. people. Yeah. And so that's, that's been real. And actually, we've started to kind of break off into areas too, because some people wanted to connect with screen free parents in their area. So there's a big community movement behind this of, of parents wanting to connect um, 
with other parents who are doing similar things. And then on our website, most uh, everything that we've talked about today, there's an article associated with. So the application that I have on my phone, how I made my smartphone dumb, there's an article mm-hmm. about that. Um, the, the kitchen cabinet and all the sensory bins that we keep in there is on there. And the, the bathroom cabinet and everything we keep on in there, is, is there's a post for that. Um, so everything, we, there's, the, there's two sides to the website. One is sort of all the research and the motivation, we call it being a tech-wise parent and giving you information about the research on kids and screens. And then the other side is the screen-free activity side, which is all the great fun stuff that you can do instead of screens, which there's a whole big world of stuff for kids to do instead of screens. Great, Megan. It's been a pleasure speaking with you. Um, I love the information that you're sharing. I think it's so important for parents to get a hold on this situation with screens and their children. Um, Thank you so much for talking with me today. Um, And I look forward to talking to you in the future again. All right. Thank you so much, Jamie. It was great to talk to you. Thank you.